Today we are continuing on with our NHL offseason plan series. We've worked our way up to the 27th ranked team from the NHL regular season, the Detroit Red Wings. What should we expect from them? We'll discuss that coming up next. So welcome back to another video here at Top Shelf Hockey. You know, as I mentioned today, we're continuing on with our offseason plan series and we're looking at the Detroit Red Wings. Now, the Red Wings are a team that have been out of the playoffs now for a few years after having a really long run and a long stretch of uh, really uh, a lot of success. For a long time, they were a playoff team for uh, 25 years, uh, which is really difficult to do. But you know what? At the same time, uh, those last number of years getting into the playoffs kind of really set them back, in my opinion. They gave away a lot of draft picks, younger prospects, etc., trying to stay relevant, trying to stay in the playoffs, uh, going forward, you know, every year. Um, and you know what? Now they're in a long rebuild. This team has been rebuilding for a little while, uh, and they're still quite a long ways away from really being competitive again. So let's take a look first at their NHL regular season statistics. Look at their salary cap situation, contracts that are coming due to expired UFAs, RFAs, and then the five burning questions facing this franchise as we head full swing into this NHL offseason. So first up, let's look at the team stats here. Now we know the Red Wings obviously were 27th in the league with a record of 19, 27, and 10 for 48 points. So obviously not a good season overall. They had a minus 44 goal differential. So again, something you expect from teams that low in the standings. The power play was atrocious, 30th in the league, only an 11.4% conversion rate. And the PK was a little bit better, but not fantastic, 78.7%. For 22nd best. Uh, now heading into this offseason, they do have $48.9 million in salary cap space. So that's a lot of money to work with. Obviously, they have a lot of expiring contracts that you'll see here coming up in our next segment. Uh, and many of these guys, even if they are back, won't be signing big money deals for the most part. So uh, they're still going to have a lot of salary cap flexibility if they choose to go into trades or free agency or anything they can do to improve this hockey club. And of course, the uh, other thing that I want to note but that's going to be big, which we'll discuss later in the video as well, is the 2021 NHL draft. This team does have a lot of draft currency, a lot of picks going into this 21 draft. So we'll see what they can do with that uh, in order to make the team better as well. So now before we go any further, we know they have tons of cap space. We obviously are going to look at the contracts followed by the, uh, the top burning questions here for this franchise. So let's now jump into the restricted and unrestricted list of players for this team heading in the offseason because it's quite extensive. The segment's going to take a little longer than some of the other teams we've looked at here. Now, on the restricted free agent side, they've got a couple of key guys, um, and some of them, it's, you know, it's debatable what the role will be going for, but certainly some of these players could be key to the future, including Tyler Bertuzzi. They have Jacob uh, Verana, who they acquired from Washington in that big trade with Anthony Mantha. Uh, obviously, I think Verana could be a big piece here for them moving forward, brings a lot of speed, whole different type of player than Mantha was. They can both score goals, but very very different uh, way in how they play. You get Adam Ernie, you get Matthias Brome, you get um, Michael Rasmussen, Evgeny Sveshnikov. Now Rasmussen and Sveshnikov both been around a little bit longer now uh, without really getting significant roles, so I, I do question their futures. Uh, defenseman Christian Juice, uh, Denis Shalowski, and Philip Ronick, of course, has been you know certainly their, their top defenseman I think for the future for what they have right now, at least what's there. They do have some more help coming in that regard though, and uh, Gustav Lindstrom as well. So they have a a lot of RFAs, I think uh, most of which will be qualified and uh, later signed. Um, but there is some that I do question whether or not they will be, uh, just given the fact of how long they've been around and um, you know whether or not the team really values them as part of the future. The way they've handled Svechnikov, I, I do wonder if he's back. Uh, hard to say. Same goes for Rasmussen. Um, but I think most others will at least get a qualifying offer, and uh, we'll see from there. Now, on the UFA front, we have a lot of veteran guys, most of which I think it's fair to say won't be back, but there's a couple of these guys I think can still be useful for them. Uh, so they got Darren Helm, a longtime Red Wing, finally coming to the end of his long-term contract that he signed way back. Uh, so I, I doubt he'll be back, but you, you never know with Iserman. Uh, you got Valtteri Filpula, uh, another player. Older, uh, I'm, I would be surprised if they bring him back. You got Luke Glendening. Now, Glendening's a guy uh, that I wouldn't be shocked if he signed a shorter-term contract. He's a, he's a good 
Uh, you know, bottom six center Reisman, good on faceoffs, brings a little bit of grit, and I know that Eisman really values how he plays, and many have said they would have a hard time imagining him playing in any other uniform. So I think there is mutual interest there to work something out. Same goes for Sam Gagne. Gagne has been a good pro, a good vet for them, and they do need to have a few guys around. So I wouldn't be shocked as well if Gagne also signed a short-term contract, but I think he'll likely explore the market and see what else is out there before making that decision. Uh, Mark Stahl, who they acquired from the New York Rangers, is a UFA. There has been some talk about him coming back, too. Um, now, on the front of Mark Stahl, though, he'll be signing for a lot less than the over $5 million that he's making now. So, obviously, it would have to come in a much, much cheaper price tag. You get Bobby Ryan, who was a pretty good story, going into Detroit this season after the buyout from Ottawa. Had a really good start, but then he kind of had a bit of a cold streak, and then he got hurt and was out for the year. So, Bobby Ryan's uh, biggest issue the last number of years, uh, on top of getting himself clean and sober which he's battled through and seems to be doing well with but besides that on the ice he's been hurt a ton in the last four or five years which has really hampered his ability to be the goal scorer that he was brought to ottawa to be that he started off being in detroit and then lost you know fairly quick like he said so many hand and finger injuries i can just imagine the arthritis he's going to have when he's a little bit older here once he's done playing hockey uh you've also got alex biega and Jonathan Bernier. Now, their futures are debatable as well. I know the Red Wings need a goalie, but they got Thomas Grice for a couple of years, who could certainly handle the role of the starting goalie. Bernier could be brought back to be like a 1A, 1B with him, could be even more of a backup, but he's he's done well in Detroit, and I think he'll get opportunities to go elsewhere, so I'm not really sure if Bernier is back or not. Now, jumping into the five burning questions here for the Detroit Red Wings as we head into full swing of the 2021 NHL off season here now first up the first question on our list today really which veterans do return as we just went through the contracts you can't have too many vets but you have to have some i mean this team needs to let their young players uh, really grow and mature into the roles that we know they can hopefully achieve someday like we saw with the Ottawa Senators this past year prime example they have a lot of young players I think the Sens rebuilds a little bit further ahead than Detroit but still similar enough situation they brought in a bunch of vets some of these younger players had to wait for their opportunity and those vets didn't work out and the team got way better after the vets were shipped out and the kids get more of a chance to play. So I think Detroit needs to do that uh, as well. Uh, but they do need some guys to stick around. Like I would be open, I think, for, if I'm Steve Eisenman, to bring him back. Uh, Bobby Ryan, possibly Glenn Denning, and maybe Sam Gagne uh, as far as these contracts go. Um, you know, when it comes to Mark Stahl in the blue line, maybe. But again, it's going to have to be short-term cheap deals. You don't want these vets tying up a ton of money and, you know, obviously a ton of uh, term here. You need some flexibility. And some of these guys could be signed only to be flipped again at the NHL trade deadline. You want guys who can be productive, play a decent role for your team, but then by the deadline, hopefully be ready enough to move on that you can get something back in return. If you sign them to one-year deals, that would be more likely impossible. So that's what I would suspect we'll see when it comes to some of these veteran guys. I would think guys like Helm and Phil Pila, um, you know, to a degree, maybe Bernier Biega might not return, but only time will tell to see what Steve Eisenman has up his sleeve here. Now, could a veteran like Franz Nielsen be looking at a buyout? I mean, that contract has not uh, aged well as many of the guys who signed contracts in the 2016 free agent class, but we're finally near the point of the near the end of the contract with Nielsen that a buyout isn't too outrageous. So I do think it's something that Eisenman will consider. Obviously, they don't need the cap space, so it's not a given that they do this, but it's more of a matter of creating the roster spot and getting more flexibility to bring in either another veteran who can be more productive or give that spot to a younger player who certainly earned his opportunity. So clearly, I think Franz Nielsen is quite likely looking at uh, moving on this offseason. I would be shocked if he gets another NHL opportunity at this stage of his career. But again, you just never know. Sometimes teams do like to have some, uh, you know, Wiley veterans around on short-term deals. Now, in the case of Nielsen, too, like he has a $5.25 million cap hit, but he doesn't have actually have a ton of money being paid out. He's only owed $3 million this season, and $1.5 of it is a signing bonus. So that signing bonus money is protected in a buyout. Uh, so a buyout would save them some money this year, uh, and they would only have some dead space next year of $500,000 in the case of Nielsen because we're only looking at one point five. So a two-thirds buyout stretched out over two years uh, saves them a little bit now, creates an open out of a roster spot, and then from there, like I said, it, it gets a small amount of dead space next year that's why i think it makes sense uh it's not overly expensive and they can move on and create the space that they need to here just from a roster spot 
Now, of course, who should they target here in the 2021 NHL draft? As I talked about in the opening segment, this team has done well with accumulating its draft selections, and they're going to be picking high in the first round. That much we know. Uh, definitely going to be picking in the top 10. Will they have any better luck this year than, than last year? Last year, they had the, the best odds of getting first overall, and they didn't get it. So... The draft lottery can be tricky. Oftentimes, you don't see the, the worst or the second worst teams getting the uh, the selections based on how the lottery balls fall. So you just never know. Will Detroit offer a better fate this year? It's difficult to say, but where they're going to be picking, you know, possibly if they get lucky enough to get first overall, they have to target a guy like Owen Power at Michigan, in my opinion. He could be that six foot six defenseman who can play a similar role like Victor Hedman's done in Tampa. That would be you know, pretty much uh, impossible to pass up on. But if they end up picking a little bit lower into the draft, like in that, you know, that six, seven, eight range, which is certainly quite possible, then I do think that one of their prime targets will be Swedish goaltender Jesper Wallstadt. This team has done an okay job so far at building up its prospects. They have some guys jumping into the lineup, hopefully next year, like defenseman Maurice Sider, Joe Valino, plus the guys that are there now that are younger. And I think that uh, they don't have much in the way of goaltending help, and they don't have a clear-cut goalie of the future. Wallstadt likely would need a couple years before being NHL ready at least uh, you know maybe it could be a CC scenario like Spencer Knight where he was such a high pick sometimes they get to the NHL a little faster and he could be their guy between the pipes solidifying that position is crucial to this team's uh, ability to continue to rebuild and come out of the rebuild to become competitive again like I'll you know kind of use Ottawa as a prime example again like I said they're a little bit ahead of the Red Wings in their rebuild and look at how awful things went in the early part of the year when they couldn't get their big save when they needed it they couldn't get the goaltending when they needed it they lost a lot of close games, but by the second half of the year, when the younger goalies like Gustafson and Decord uh, were playing well, even Forsberg after he's picked up on waivers, they started getting a lot more wins, and they were one of the better teams in the NHL in the last like 15 to 20 games of the season. So clearly, this team needs goaltending, so Walsett to me should be a prime target, but of course, that does depend on where their selection is going to fall. Now, of course, they also have a second first-round pick. They have the first-rounder that came from the Washington Capitals and the uh, Mantha Verana trade. So they do have a, a later first-round pick. Obviously, the Caps at this point are already eliminated. So that pick isn't going to be too, too low. So clearly, that's another prospect they can look at. Now, they could also consider using that as trade currency to either move up or down in that first round. Maybe they package that first-rounder with a later pick uh, in order to get another higher first-rounder. That's a possibility. Or maybe they trade that pick for a player who can help them immediately either way they have the extra currency and they also have uh, a decent amount of other picks here in the early rounds of this draft here as well they have 12 picks total in this draft after acquiring several other mid-round picks as well and they have seven picks in the first three rounds including two in the first and then multiple second and third rounders so they have lots of draft currency so i would suspect you're going to see Iserman not use all of those picks uh, at least one or two of them maybe be packaged together to either move up or to get a player who can help them immediately would be my guess but like i said a lot of who they target will certainly be determined by their luck or lack thereof in the draft lottery as far as what other moves do you see this team making this offseason do they use that cap space they have to dip into free agency do they try to swing some bigger trades to inquire some players who can make this team more relevant right away and to be honest i don't think they do a lot of that i think they use their cap space to maybe get some more assets for the future at most like we saw a lot of teams near the nhl trade deadline taking on unfavorable contracts with sweeteners like extra assets young players or draft picks that they can use for future building blocks that to me makes more sense i don't think the red wings can make enough deals this offseason to get to the point where they're seriously competitive and can contend for a playoff spot especially expecting the divisions to go back to where they were previously prior to the pandemic you know that competing with teams like toronto and tampa and we saw how good florida was this year you get the boston bruins in there and of course you got a team like ottawa who like i said of all the lower teams in that division are ahead of that rebuild and then you get even the montreal canadians in there as well who are facing the leafs in game seven like those are at least five teams right there that you know that are stronger than you right now. You get the Buffalo Sabres, Detroit Red Wings that are likely going to be you know near the bottom of that division and again, in my opinion. So to me, considering what's coming in the next couple of drafts with some top high-end elite talent like Shane Wright and Matthew Bedard, to me, I would not be in a hurry to get better that quickly. One of those players would be way more impactful on your franchise than what you're going to get in this draft. There is some really good players near the top of the 21 draft, but I'm not convinced right now, at least, that they're going to be that high-end, really organizational 
change a game changer to really take them up a level like you've seen with like a Connor McDavid for example or an Austin Matthews like Owen Power is really good some of the other guys near the high end of this draft are good as well like they're going to be really good players they're just not expected to be that really high end elite level like you're going to see with Wright and Bedard so to me there's no hurry here I would want one of those two guys on my team if you can help it in the next few years so Clearly, I don't think they really use a lot of that space to really try to get better that quickly because I'm just not sure that it's really possible to take that big of a step in one single season. And then lastly here is how much of an impact are they going to make the young players have on this team? Are they going to be able to create enough room here to give them opportunities? They're going to bring in veterans to make them compete for it. Hard to say, but guys like Joe Valino that are coming get an opportunity at the end of the year and Maurice Sider had a huge year over in Europe. Sider is going to be the real deal and will certainly be a top defenseman for them uh, for many years to come. Uh, he's proven that and I think uh, proved a lot of doubters wrong. I think a lot of people were surprised by that selection a couple years ago at the draft, but I think people are going to see just how good he is and justify that selection here uh, in the not too distant future so obviously they have lots of other young players around them already like a philip Cezino, who was a high first round pick as well and you're only going to continue to get better here um so personally i think that these guys compete with some of the other vets that are there but i do see their young players taking a bigger role this season and to me that's going to be a big part of the future they need to see what they have in their young players now to know how much of a building block they are to build around so they can really judge where this franchise is at moving forward of course, we also found out as well that Coach Jeff Blaschel is definitely going to be back. I know for some teams, there's question marks around that moving into the offseason, but we already know that Iserman's not going anywhere, and neither is Jeff Blaschel, who signed an extension which was believed to be for another two seasons. Clearly, Steve Iserman feels like he hasn't given Blaschel the proper roster and tools necessary to really move the team forward, so he still has confidence in him as a coach. I know a lot of the fan base were unhappy about that, but I guess we'll see how the development of these young players go uh, for like the next year or so. Obviously, you know, could they make a change down the road? Sure. I mean, I'm not sure Blaschel is the guy to take this team into the next phase of the rebuild. But as long as they're going to be struggling and, you know, be somewhat of a lower ranked team here as they work towards building things up, he could be the coach. But when they're ready to compete again, I think they'll likely go in a new direction at that point but let me know what your thoughts are on the red wings what do you expect from them in this offseason and how much more of an improvement can we see by next year let me know your thoughts in the comments we'll discuss further of course stay tuned for the other coming teams in this video uh coming up here every day this week thank you for watching and i'll catch you next time <laughs>